GIS has been around for more than 60 years at this point, and it was originally invented to solve a particular problem. Uh, in the early 1960s, the Canadian government passed a law requiring the inventory of lands throughout the country and the classification in terms of their usefulness for agriculture, for timber, for other types of uses. The problem was that, well, Canada is a very large country, one of the largest in the world, and uh, the uh, agencies that were tasked with doing this inventory of land use across the country realized that they'd have to produce something on the order of about around 2,000 large-scale maps that would focus on different areas, and they have to hand count and calculate the amount of area for agriculture, for timber, for other uses. And they figured out that it would take something on the order of about 100 million man-hours to complete. So it was an impossible task if it was done that way. Well, along came a man by the name of Roger Tomlinson, who was working for um, a private surveying company, and they paired up with IBM and the Canadian government, and they developed a way to use computers to automate the task of essentially counting all the different types of land use across all these different maps, which of course had to be converted into a digital form. But the process made it possible to do this enormous task that otherwise would have been nearly impossible had it been done manually. Well, and life's never been the same since because geographic information systems turned out to be really useful on a lot of different fronts. This week we're talking about the use of GIS for analysis. Uh, and analysis includes a broad category of activities where we're trying to understand something better or to make better decisions. Uh, and it often comes down to asking series of questions. So commonly with GIS, we use it to ask questions relating to the relationships between different layers of data. So for example, in hazards mapping, we're looking, for, we're looking at uh, areas that pose a hazard. For, for example, monitoring of radon exposure. Radon is a gas that's naturally emitted by certain kinds of rocks or geology, uh, and the gas is radioactive, and if you get too much of it, it can actually lead to lung cancer and other problems. And there are active monitoring programs to help people uh, deal with it um, or and identify it. So one common problem might be, for example, to identify areas that are likely to be exposed to radon gas. And so we know what types of geology are associated with the presence of radon gas. So imagine that we had a couple of layers. We'd have a layer showing where people lived, residential areas, and then we have another layer showing the geology underlying the same area. Looking for the areas that intersect, that is to say, that show residential areas that are, have, that are commonly or come into contact with those types of geology can help us identify more efficiently what areas to target in terms of outre outreach and education. Another common use of GIS in an analytical context is to look for uh, habitat analysis or a type of site suitability. So say for example that we were looking to identify the optimum habitat for a particular snail that's endangered and um, doing a manual inventory or census of the snail, going out there and actually trying to count snails, might be um, too difficult, too expensive, and just not practical, particularly in rugged country. But let's say in instead that we could talk to an ecologist or a biologist who knows what the snail needs to survive, so it can kind of predict where the snail is likely to occur. And so the ecologist or the biologist tells us, well, the snail only lives in certain elevation ranges, right? say above 1,100 feet or so. And the snail needs certain kinds of soil type, uh, which tends to ha have a high calcium content, and that's associated with limestone, which is a particular type of geology. And lastly, the snail tends to like uh, areas that are densely wooded because they're going to be cooler and moister. So for the GIS analyst, what that means is, well, we can bring together these different layers that meet each of these criteria and what we're looking for is a place where all of these conditions overlap or intersect again. In this case the proper elevation combined with limestone geology and soils combined with dense forest cover and then what's left over are those areas that meet all three criteria simultaneously and there you have the possibility of finding the optimum habitat for the snail 
save yourself a lot of time and money.